thank you very much uh, i'd like to thank everybody for coming here again to listen to my talk which is i am not sure whether it uh, is effective for all or not i'd like to dedicate today's lecture to uh, professor tima farooq who, who is like a elder brother to me always from my internship days and i will always remember আ আমি ইকবাল স্যার এবং জাহাঙ্গীর স্যারকেও থ্যাংক ইউ দিতে চাই যে তারা আমাকে দিয়ে জোর করে এই ক্লাসটা ক্লিনিক্যাল ক্লাস একটা নেওয়ার জন্য খুব জোর জোর করলো সেই জন্য খুব তরি ঘড়ি করে এটা প্রিপেয়ার করে আমি এটা নিচ্ছি জানি না কেমন হবে বাট এগেন আই উইল ট্রাই মাই বেস্ট নিউরোমা স্কুলের ব্লকিং এজেন্টস what is exactly its clinical use uh, the clinical use of uh, this drug is mainly in anesthesia to facilitate endotracheal intubation or to improve surgical condition these are the two main things that we do with uh, neuromuscular blocking agent at the same time we know that endotracheal intubation can also be done by uh, deep anesthesia or without muscle relaxants in those cases there is every chance of injury to the larynx and injury to the vocal cords and things like that and also injuries to the mouth as 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 a whole so when we use muscle relaxants we also decrease the incidences of hoarseness and also vocal cord injuries during intubation and we the other important thing that we can do is facilitate mechanical ventilation in patients with poor lung compliance mainly in the icu so how how do we select our neuromuscular blocking agents in our daily practice the selection of the agents depends on the clinical application and patient factors we know that the clinical applications of different drugs and the patient factors patient factor is very important in selecting any neuromuscular drug as a whole if we consider if the uh, procedure is less than 30 minutes then and we are doing monitoring of course whatever i am saying here always it includes neuro monitoring monitoring is a must for neuromuscular blocking agents whenever we are using it so when we are using it for less than 30 minutes we can use uh, a short duration of uh, uh, drugs that are of very short acting and this can be done by uh, into the endotracheal intubation by succinyl choline which we know that is very uh, very on set of action is very fast and its duration of action is also very slow and and then continue with the uh, anesthesia either with uh, simple inhalation anesthesia or with uh, any opioids or something and if we uh, really require we can use short acting non depolarizing drugs like rocuronium vecuronium and if sugamadex is available then there is no limit of drugs that we can use and for procedures that are longer than 30 minutes we can use both the drugs that is succinyl choline for the tracheal intubation also uh, we can use rocuronium in a higher dose for tracheal intubation a higher dose means if we use four into ed95 of rocuronium which is 1.2 mg and then we can uh, intubate the patient in uh, 60 seconds uh, uh, it's almost similar to succinyl choline but in that case the only problem is the duration of action is a little bit longer but in any way we are doing procedures which is more than 30 minutes so we can use that very well usually uh, the drugs that we use for uh, non depolarizing agents are rocuronium vecuronium ibuprofen atracurium cisatracurium because these are all intermediate acting drugs we usually don't use pancurinium nowadays except in cases of cardiac which the cardiac anesthetists usually prefer pancurinium for as it produces some tachycardia the selection when we select succinyl choline we know that succinyl choline provides the most reliable and fastest intubating conditions and is therefore the preferred neuromuscular blocking agents for rapid sequence induction and intubation we call it rsir 
And as I said, we can also use rocuronium in 4 into ED95, 1.2 milligram per kg, which we can do it in 60 seconds. And after uh, tracheal intubation, the intraoperative relaxation can be maintained by any uh, non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. We'll discuss this later on. And now the factors. What are the factors that affect? As I have said, the patient factors and the drug factors. Patient factors, we know that a number of patient factors that are responsible for the action of neuromuscular blocking agents and its onset and its duration every first is neuromuscular diseases as a whole if we consider the neuromuscular diseases then we should know this is the principle neuromuscular blocking agents should be avoided or doses should be modified in patients with some neuromuscular diseases succinylcholine may cause life-threatening hyperkalemia we know that and should be avoided in conditions associated with denervation and associated with upregulation of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the cojunctional membrane, also the extrajunctional membrane. And sensitivity to non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents may be increased or variable in patients with neuromuscular disease. So the main thing is when we use succinylcholine, we have to be very careful of our hyperkalemia uh, because the patients with denervation and associated uh, upregulation of N nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, they are susceptible to succinylcholine. So we should use it with more carefully. And for non depolarizing one, we should, the, uh, ma in maximum cases, the drugs uh, doses should be increased or maybe similar to normal one. So what are the neuromuscular diseases that we, are, we should be most careful about? Uh, motor neuron diseases, peripheral neuropathies, disorders of the neuromuscular transmissions, muscular dystrophies, metabolic and mitochondrial myopathies, non-dystrophic myotonia. Again, if we say the principle, succinylcholine or succinylcholine should be avoided in all neuromuscular diseases except myasthenia gravis. Why myasthenia gravis? Myasthenia gravis is, is the, we know that it, uh, it is due to the antibodies produced against the acetylcholine receptors. In that case, we need more and more acetylcholine. So succinylcholine is the only drug that we can use here. The other, uh, the use of non-depolarizing muscle reagents can often be avoided by judicious use of intravenous induction agents. However, if required, it should be given in reduced dose. Uh, Atracuram is a popular choice due to its spontaneous Hoffman degradation, but the key to muscular blockade is careful titration and close monitoring. As I have always said, monitoring is the most important thing in the use of neuromuscular blocking agents. Whenever we are using any muscle relaxants in our daily practice, we should use the monitoring. And, and in cases where there is muscular neuromuscular diseases, monitoring is always a must. In a nutshell, if we have motor neuron diseases, succinylcholine, you cannot use amino steroid, yes, but in lower doses, isoquinolines, yes, but in lower doses. Peripheral neuropathies, no. Succinylcholine, amino steroid, and isoquinolines, we can use. Myasthenia gravis, succinylcholine is the only drug, and maybe in, in increased dose, we cannot use any amino steroids or isoquinolines. Oh, isoquinolines, we can use a atracurium like drugs or mevacuria, isoconolins, which produces a action like succinylcholine. Progressive muscular dystrophies, no succinylcholine, periodic paralysis, no succinylcholine, but amino steroid and isoconolins we can use. What happens in Barnes? Barn injury, up, we know that barn injury upregulates extrajunctional uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors beginning with 24 hours of injury. As a result, at Administration of succinylcholine after 48 hours for up to a year after a major burn can cause severe hyperkalemia and life threatening arrhythmias and should always be avoided. Upregulation of nicotine acetylcholine receptors also causes resistance to non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents and reduces duration of action. So we have to use it at a higher dose. Extremes of ages in geriatric age group. In older adult patients, the effect of steroidal neuromuscular blocking agents 
these are prolonged due to decreased volume of distribution, changes in circulatory physiology and increased regional and erratic hepatic blood flow. Uh, what can we do? We can use smaller doses and less frequent dosing intervals so that we can use uh, uh, and of course with monitoring. In pediatric age group, immature receptors, we know that pediatric age group have immature receptors. The uh, gamma receptors is there, which we don't have in adult receptors. Usually within one month, it starts to change. Children require a higher dose of non depolarizing neuromuscular agents, and infant and neonates are more sensitive. In pediatric age group, the duration of action of vecurinum is relatively prolonged. I'm not sure why, but many clinicians usually consider rocurinum as the drug of choice here because succinyl choline is absolutely more or less contraindicated in case of children nowadays. FDS totally, uh, and it's a black box uh, warning that succinyl choline should not be used in pediatric groups. Atracurium and cisatracurium is preferred for short duration of surgery. And as I said, routine administration of succinyl choline in children is discontinued for is uh, adverse actions like cardiac arrhythmia, cardiac arrest, hyperkalemia. If we look at this figure, here we see that procurinium in infant onset time is 0 0.6. In child, 1.3. In adult, it is 1.5 to 3, depending on the dose. And vecurinium is the higher, so always rocurinium is the choice here. And also we can choose atracurium, although the onset is uh, a little bit higher, but the duration is a shorter, 22 to 29. So, and it's also caused by Hoffman degradation. So uh, atracurium and cisatracurium are more preferred uh, drugs with rocurinia. What happens in obesity? The dose of succinyl choline should be based on total body weight for optimal intubating conditions. That is, we know that. And if we use non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents, the results are conflicting. The method is, as usual, so, uh, optimal method for calculating doses is very obese patients is unclear, but we calculate doses for uh, this drug based on ideal body weight plus 10%. For that, uh, because this obese patient has a lot of fat, so we have to consider all these facts. In case of hepatic and renal diseases, Isocholinian drugs are preferred for patients with hepatic or renal dysfunction, since we know that clearance of the drug is independent of organ function. Uh, and again, cisatracurium is more preferable here than atracurium because atracurium has its own side effect. Succinyl choline may be used in these patients for, with renal disease as long as there is no hypothalamia. What happens in hypothalamia? Hypothermia causes prolonged response to non-depolarizing muscle agents, uh, muscle agents, as lower temperatures can affect excretion, volume of distribution, interaction with post-junctional receptors, and pH at the neuromuscular junction. The response is usually seen when the temperature comes below 35 degrees centigrade. Always monitoring that we have to do in case of hypothermic patient, we need less amount of uh, non depolarizing agents, amino steroid mainly. Then, electrolyte disturbance, magnesium. Hypermagnesiumia causes muscle relaxation, we know that, and it potentiates the effects of uh, muscle relaxation and prolong, prolong the duration of action of rocuronia. Uh, hypermagnesiumia is usually a iatrogenic cause because we know that magnesium is routinely administered in interpartum and postpartum period for patients with preeclampsia to prevent seizures. If these patients by chance require general anesthesia, non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents should be used very cautiously and with monitoring. And since magnesium does not potentiate the effect of succinyl choline, succinyl choline can be used uh, easily for rapid sequence induction and integration. Potassium, we know that hypokalemia potentiate non depolarizing muscle relaxants and antagonize the action of depolarizing agents. Hyperkalemia, resistant to non-depolarizing agents, but very sensitive to depolarizing agents. Calcium, hypercalcemia causes reduced response to administration of non-depolarizing agents. Calcium triggers the release of acetylcholine into neuromuscular junction. We know that from the last class. 
and enhances the excitation contraction coupling of the myocyte. Hypercalcemic patients may require larger doses of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants to achieve a desired level. Hypocalcemia, on the other hand, should be confirmed by measuring, it, it is always confirmed by measuring the ionized calcium and excluding the falsely low levels of calcium due to low plasma albumin levels. You have to be very careful that the plasma albumin is normal in these patients. And the plasma calcium can have antagonistic actions at the neuromuscular junction at the presynaptic membrane. It can decrease the amplitude of depolarization, thus antagonizing the non-depolarizing block. Acid-based disorder. Acidosis can prolong the effects of muscle relaxants by increasing the neuromuscular blocking actions affinity for co-junctional receptors. Uh, acidosis Usually, acidosis usually prolongs the neuromuscular action of amino steroid, but not the isoquinoline as much as the amino steroid. On the other hand, alkalosis again it decreases the action of amino steroid, but not as much as the isoquinoline drug. And it happens when the pH goes beyond 7.2 or 7.6. And now drug interactions. When you use uh, muscle relaxants, you have to take care of other drugs that the patients are having. We know that the drug reactions can occur at nerve terminal, synaptic cleft, postsynaptic membrane, and all three locations at the same time. Uh, we'll uh, talk about the drugs a little bit later. Uh, first, uh, we, in case of intensive care unit, what are the usual recommendations for neuromuscular blocking drugs? Avoid the use of neuromuscular blockers by maximal use of analgesic and sedatives, manipulation of ventilatory parameters and modes. Uh, recently, uh, recently in prolonged intubation, intubated patients or prolonged ventilated patients, usually the muscle relaxants are not used. We try to do it by sedation and also by uh, parameters, manipulating the parameters of the ventilator usually. And if we have to use neuromuscular blocker, use of a peripheral nerve stimulator with train of for monitoring, do not administer for more than two days continuously, administer by bolus rather than infusion, administer only when required and to achieve a well-defined goal, continually allow recovery from paralysis or consider alternative therapy. Because in these conditions, continuous use of muscle relaxants causes muscle paralysis and sometimes the weakness of the muscles occurs uh, when, whenever we are trying to wean off from the ventilator. Should succinylcholine be used in patients in intensive care unit? In ICU, it is likely that upregulation of the receptors induced by immobilization occurs due to the higher incidence of cardiac arrest associated with the use of succinylcholine in ICU patients and increased requirement for non-depolarizing drugs in ICU. Succinylcholine should be avoided in in ICU patients in whom total body immobilization exceeds 24 hours. It is understandable. Same as neuromuscular uh, muscle, dystrophy. Combination of neuromuscular blocking agents. If we use two drugs simultaneously, what happens? In some clinical circumstances, succinylcholine may be administered before or after a non-depolarizing neuromuscular drug, or two different non-depolarizing neuromuscular drugs may be administered in sequence. Combination of these drugs can affect the degree of neuromuscular block and subsequent management should be guided by the use of, again, the monitor. What happens when we use alcoholine with a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant? Prior administration of any non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drug has a substantial antagonistic effect on the subsequent depolarizing block induced by succinylcholine. Uh, there was a practice that uh, any non-depolarizing drugs in a small dose is used before succinylcholine to reduce the uh, fasciculations and muscle pain. But actually, in that case, we can see that there is a substantial antagonistic effect, so it is not recommended. But the effect of prior administration of succinylcholine on subsequent administration of non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs depends on the drug use, and there is no problem in that. We can use succinylcholine for uh, RSII, and then we can use any uh, amino steroids or benzylacetonilum drugs with the same potency and 
for our uh, for the throughout the duration of the surgery without any problem. If we use two non-depolarizing drugs, two different kinds of non-depolarizing drugs, then what happens? Combining two non-depolarizing neuromuscular drugs at the same structural class, such as rocurinium and vecurinium, produces an additive area interaction. So, two if we use two amino steroids, there is additive interaction. But when you use amino steroid with a isoquinoline, there is a synergistic response. So two amino steroids, if you use like rocurinium and vicurinium, we have an additive interaction. And if you use rocurinium and c there is a synergist, synergistic response. Why the synergistic response? Because the simultaneous pre and post-junctional receptors are inhibited uh, because uh, the amino steroid inhibits the post-junctional and the isoquinoline, the pre- and post-junctional both. Augmented conformational attachment to pre- and post-junctional cholinergic receptor, altered protein binding, non-cholinergic tissue binding by one of the other drug, and partial desensitization of acetylcholine receptor by benzyl isoquinoline group. So there is a synergistic. What is the interaction with inhaled anesthetics? Inhale anesthetics inhibit the nicotinic receptors and potentiate neuromuscular blockade with non depolarizing neuromuscular drug. The potentiation depends on the type of volatile anesthetic. It is highest with this fluorine, then sevofluorine, then isofluorine, then halothane, and then nitroxide. With potent inhalation agents like with desfluorine and sevofluorine, the maintenance dose of Muscle relaxation, the amino steroids are reduced by 25 to 30 percent. How it acts? Inhalation agents decrease release of acetylcholine presynaptically. They don't bind acetylcholine receptor, but they dissolve in the lipid membrane and decrease the channel opening time with increase in channel closing time, thus in induce reduction in channel conductance. Due to vasodilatory effect of inhalation agents, there is increased availability of the agents at the neuromuscular junction and a central effect of alpha motor neurons and interneuronal synapses. What happens with IV anesthetics? These agents cause increased acetylcholine release presynaptically, desensitization of the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. So, what is the effect? The two effects balance each other, so, no clinically significant interaction is seen. Ketamine only in potentiate the effect of deep tuberculin. It was seen in some tests, but it is uh, the curinine is not used anymore, so it doesn't matter. Antibiotics, tetracycline, aminoglycosides, polymyxines, and clindamycin potentiate the neuromuscular blockade. In practice, this interaction is most relevant during maintenance of anesthesia. Antibiotics typically are given after a dose of neuromuscular blocking agents has already been administered for induction of anesthesia. Thus, the interaction between such antibiotics and the neuromuscular blocking agents must be considered when redosing of muscle relaxants. Appropriate monitoring is always helpful. What is the mechanism? It is not fully understood, but possible mechanisms are inhibition of acetylcholine release, desensitization of post-junctional nicotinic acetylcholine receptors to acetylcholine and channel block. What happens with anti-seizure drugs? Patients receiving chronic treatment for nitro and carbamazepine are relatively resistant to non-depolarizing, mainly steroidal muscle relaxants. And phenytoin also alters sensitivity to neuromuscular junctions to muscle relaxants. It has a mild blocking action of neuromuscular junction. Antidepressants, in laboratory studies, sertraline and amitriptyline inhibit Plasma cholinesterase and prolonged paralysis after administration of mevacurium has been reported. Antipsychotics, especially lithium. Patients who take lithium can have a prolonged latency and duration of blockade to both depolarizing and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. The prolonged effect of non-depolarizing uh, muscle relaxants is due to lithium-induced inhibition of synthesis and release of acetylcholine. And Lithium structurally resembles a sodium. It travels with sodium during depolarization, but due to atomic difference, its efflux is only 10%. So intracellular accumulation causes hyperpolarizations of the cell membrane, therefore potentiate the non-depolarizing muscle like. Local anesthetics may enhance the effects of both depolarizing and non-depolarizing muscle reactions through pre- and postsynaptic interactions at the neuromuscular junction. 
administration of local anesthetics or regional anesthesia may result in blood levels high enough to potentiate muscle relaxants induced neuromuscular block. What is the mechanism? It is presynaptically local anesthetic causes selective depression of motor fiber conduction, decreased release of acetylcholine during nerve stimulation, and in the postsynaptic, it causes binding to different acetylcholine specific sites, resulting in desensitization of the receptor. Temporary occlusion of the ion channel in the hypotonic system. Effect of greater blockers, they aggravate or unmask myasthenia gravis, can potentiate and prolong the effects of neuromuscular blocking drugs. Again, it is mainly due to the upregulation of the extrajunctional nicotinic receptor. So we know muscle relaxants, we know what it does, and we know what are the factors that influence the action of the muscle relaxants. Now, what is the clinical use of neuromuscular blocking agents? Why you use that? Mainly, we know that it is for endotracheal intubation. The most common indication for the use of muscle relaxing anesthesia is to facilitate endotracheal intubation. The goal of muscle paralysis for endotracheal intubation is to achieve ideal intubation conditions, which are dependent on the depth of anesthesia, airway anatomy, and the experience of the anesthesiologist. More intense block is associated with better intubation conditions. We know that a dose of 2 into ED95 usually for a given muscle relaxation should be sufficient for routine intubation. But if we want to increase the onset time, we have to increase the dose to 4 into ED95. Uh, the use of muscle relaxants, as I've already mentioned, that it reduces the incidence of post-intubation hoarseness and airway injury. In a 218 meta-analysis, a randomized control trial that compared endotracheal intubation with muscle relaxants and without muscle relaxants reported increased risk of difficult intubation and an increased risk of upper airway discomfort and injury if muscle relaxants were avoided for intubation. Succinylcholine. When we are talking about tracheal intubation, we must know about succinylcholine. It is commonly used for endotracheal intubation because of its reliable and rapid onset of neuromuscular blockage. Skeletal muscle relaxation can be assumed immediately after resolution of the fasciculations that occur with succinylcholine. After administration of succinylcholine, a non depolarizing muscle relaxation should not be administered until the return of neuromuscular function has been documented as confirmation of normal pseudocholine extrase activity. This is very important. When we are using any amino steroid or benzyl isoquinolone drugs after succinylcholine, we must wait for the action of succinylcholine to finish wear off and then we use. Otherwise, the problem with succinylcholine that we'll discuss later will come. And for endotracheal intubation, what happens to non depolarizing muscle relaxants? They do not cut fasciculations, we know that. Therefore, we suggest the use of an objective neuromuscular function monitor to determine when optimal neuromuscular blockage is achieved after administration of non depolarizing muscle relaxants. We know that central muscle groups, that is the diaphragm and laryngeal adductors, are blocked faster than peripheral muscle groups, like the adductor policies, where we monitor after administration of muscle relaxants. We have talked about this last time. Therefore, if optimal neuromuscular blockage, what is optimal neuromuscular blockage? It is defined as the total suppression of evoked responses to train of force stimulation. That is, train of force should, ratio should be zero. It's confirmed by monitoring adductor policy stimulation. So when we see the QF zero in adductor policy stimulation, by that time, all the pharyngeal muscles are usually blocked. Pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles are usually blocked, and ideal optimal intubating conditions has already been achieved. The onset time of non depolarizing muscle relaxation can be shortened by increasing the dose. We know that, we have talked about it. As an example, rocklonium uh, onset time can be reduced to 60 seconds if we use four times ED95. And the other way of reducing the onset time is the priming which is 10 to 20% of the intubating dose is given first. And then with that, we occupy 70% of the receptor. And then when we give the rest amount of the uh, intubating dose, then we can reduce the onset time to, uh, to add the similarity of the succinylcholine. So muscle relaxants first 
clinical use is uh, tracheal intubation, and the next thing is facilitation of surgeon. Because we, uh, why should we intubate a patient if there is no surgery is required other than ICU? So surgery is important, and we need a relaxed patient for the surgeon to perform the surgery. Non-depolarizing muscle relaxing may be used to provide muscle relaxing that improves surgical conditions. We know that we use that for that. A neuromuscular blockade improves the surgical conditions during laparoscopic, robotic, abdominal, and thoracic procedures by reducing patient movement, muscle tone, and breathing, and coughing against the ventilator. Muscle reactions also allow lower insufflation pressures during laparoscopy. The benefits of deep versus moderate muscle relaxation during laparoscopy are also unclear. Many of the theoretical benefits of neuromuscular blockade can be achieved by making sure that patients are adequately anesthetized at all times during surgery. Now, if we consider what are the types of neuromuscular block, we, there are moderate, deep, intense, and minimal block. So moderate, what is moderate block? When neuromuscular blockade is indicated, for most surgical procedures, the aim is for a moderate level of blockade. We, need, we don't need a deep block always. We, Actually, we need a moderate level of blockage. Well, two or three twitches using an objective peripheral nerve stimulator, which means in TOF count, we can see at least one or two counts. Once neuromuscular block begins to recover from deep level to paralysis required for endotracheal intubation, a moderate level of block may be maintained with interval dosing or an infusion of non depolarizing agents guided by monitoring. When guided by objective monitoring, administration of agents by infusion may reduce the total dose required for surgical relaxation. As I've said in my last days that monitoring reduces the dose required because if we give it every 20 minutes, because the duration of action is 20 minutes, as we know from books, this is not always true. If we monitor, we can reduce the dose. At the conclusion of the abdominal surgery, this is very important, at the conclusion of the abdominal surgery, a more Moderate level of relaxation of abdominal muscle is often sufficient to facilitate closure of the wound. A deep level of block should be avoided at this stage of the operation to allow rapid and complete reversal facilitate closure without administration of neuromuscular block. What is deep neuromuscular block? Deep levels of neuromuscular blockade where there is a TOF ratio is zero or there is TOF uh, count is zero and PTC is not zero. PTC is two, three, uh, four, five, six may be warranted in specific settings, in addition to ensuring adequate depth of anesthesia. And as an example, a complete paralysis may be indicated during delicate dissection under the microscope during craniotomy, when any unexpected movement must be avoided. Especially in neurosurgery, in ophthalmic surgery, a deep level of neuromuscular blockage is required. The main problem with neuromuscular blockage that we face is the residual neuromuscular blockage. So we have to avoid the residual neuromuscular blockage. The reason I said the, at the end of the surgery, we should not, we should avoid using the muscle relaxants is only because of to avoid the residual neuromuscular blockage at the end of the surgery. Our primary goal is anesthetic management is to ensure complete recovery of the neuromuscular function at the end of anesthesia. That is, strain of four ratio should be more than 0 0.9 or 90% recovery. We know that residual neuromuscular block uh, is an important risk factor for anesthesia-related morbidity and mortality in the post-op uh, recovery room. Even minor degrees of residual block are associated with weakness of the upper airway muscles, the airway obstruction, increased risk of aspiration, and unpleasant muscle weakness. Incomplete postoperative neuromuscular recovery can also cause prolonged recovery room stay, hypoxemia, airway obstruction, awareness during emergence from anesthesia, and increased postoperative pulmonary complications. In a meta analysis of 24 randomized and observation studies, including 3,375 patients anesthetized between 1979 to 2005. Residual block that is less than TOFR ratio, less than 0 0.9, occurred in 41% of patients. With so much monitoring and with so much knowledge about muscle relaxation, still the uh, uh, rate of 
residual block is 41%, which is very, very, very high. So neuromuscular monitoring is a must. What is the suggested strategy? What should we do to avoid this uh, residual block? Use intermediate or short acting agents rather than long acting agents. That is, avoid pancurinium whenever possible. Avoid deep neuromuscular blockade, that is, strain of four count of zero when clinically appropriate. So, for, as I said, for most surgical conditions, moderate block is okay. Use objective neuromuscular monitoring. Again, uh, use objective neuromuscular monitoring whenever possible to guide administration of muscle relaxants. And during recovery, especially during recovery, monitoring is must. Administer reversal agents in appropriate doses and guided by the degree of recovery from the block. Administer no reversal agents if adequate spontaneous recovery has been achieved as demonstrated by a quantity fee of ratio of 0 0.9. So we don't need any muscle, uh, any reversal in that case if the spontaneous recovery is more than 0 0.9. So we need monitoring. We need to administer neostigmine in appropriate doses only if spontaneous recovery has reached train of four count to four. So neostigmine is not given at deep or moderate block. It's only given when the patient is in the process of recovery and the count, TOF count is four. If spontaneous recovery has not reached, that is TOF count is not at four, we, it's better to use sugamadex rather than neostigmine for reversal of steroidal neuromuscular blocking agents. If sugamadex is unavailable, wait for spontaneous recovery to achieve a count of four before administrating neostigmine. Extubate the trachea only after ratio is achieved 0 0.9. If Quantitative monitoring is not available. Administer neostigmine only when the count is four. At the, as the operation nears completion, allow the patient to recover to a count of four, TF count of four, by the time the surgeons start to close the wound, when neostigmine is administered, uh, administered at this time. And continue the surgery with, uh, if required, if required with inhalation anesthetics anesthetics or so reversal again a train of four ratio of 0 0.9 should be achieved prior to tracheal extubation following administration of muscle relaxants reversal of neuromuscular block after administration of agents can occur by spontaneous recovery or by administration of reversal agents reversal agents include anticholine stress we know that is sigmine and sugamadex the only available selective relaxant reversal agent so what is the, uh, if we summarize, the prediction of tracheal intubation, a single tweet or train of four response absence. Interpretation is adequate condition is likely only if high dose is given. Interoperative condition, ETC is one, two, or train of four is one, two, or TOF is four, with, uh, then PTC is one or two with D block one, TOF one or two is moderate block. We need this level of anesthesia here this level of blockade. And when the TUF is count is four, then there's a shallow blockade and an additional dose is required. Management of recovery, when the PTC is zero, we cannot use neostigmine. We have to use for either we have to wait or if sugamadex is available, we have to give 16 milligram per kg of sugamadex, which can reverse and any non-depolarizing blocking agents when the PTC is, is zero. This is the uh, beauty of sugamadex. When PTC is one or two, we can again wait or use sugamadex at a reduced dose. If the TOF is two, we can wait till it is four. Or when the TOF is four, we use neostigmine or wait for uh, spontaneous recovery. Management of recovery, again, we can use the double burst stimulation. If there is a fade, weight or new segment can be given, or uh, if there is DBS without fade, that we, the, both the switches are almost same, we can use new segment. And if the TOF is more, more than less than 0 0.9, we can use new segment. If it is more than 0 0.7, we can use new segment. This is Again, a figure which shows actually 
uh, the, the, the whatever we are saying, if the TOF count is zero, PTC zero, TOF is zero, this is a profound block and we can use sugamide at 16 milligram, no new stigma, no adroponium. This, this is something like that. It is a deep block, the ratio is zero, but the PTC is more than one. We can use four milligram to eight milligram of sugamadex and no adroponium on new stigma. This is this, uh, the, this figure tells us what to use and how to use. Spontaneous recovery virtualization should only be omitted when clinicians can confirm adequate recovery from neuromuscular blockage to a train of ratio of 0 0.9 or greater. That we have already. And anticholine stress, we have uh, in, uh, in how it works. It works by increasing the availability of acetylcholine at the junction. And we have two types, neostigmine and adrophonium. Neostigmine is usually preferred despite a slower action of uh, onset of action than adroponium because this pigment has a higher affinity for acetylcholine receptor. Reversal of neuromuscular block with neostigmine takes a longer during inhalation anesthesia uh, uh, than during intravenous. If we, the median time from administration of neostigmine at train of four count of three to recovery of train of four uh, ratio of 0 0.9 was 15.6 minutes during sevoflurane anesthesia. It's 5.4 minutes during propofol anesthesia. And uh, the median time of recovery of new stigmine when administered if the TF count is four, 9.7 minutes in sevoflurane and 4.7 minutes during propofol. So it is greater with inhalation anesthesia. Then sugamadex, we have talked about sugamadex last time. It is uh, affinity is the greatest for ocorunium, followed by decreasing order affinity of acorunium, pancorunium, and pipicorunium. It, uh, we know that it acts by encapsulating the neuromus, uh, the agents, especially ocorunium, in the plasma, not in the neuromuscular junction. And, where, and when the level of drug is reduced in the plasma, it goes from the neuromuscular junction to the plasma to be again encapsulated by sugamadex. Elimination of sugamadex is usually renally excreted and is excreted in the urine unchanged. Can bind and inhibit oral contraceptives. So patients should be asked not to use oral contraception drugs prior to any anesthesia if we are considering using sugamadex at least seven days. Adverse effects of sugamadex, there are hypersensitivity reactions, there are sometimes there's cardiac arrhythmias and others like in coagulation parameters may be derived in some small cases. Now we know all about drugs and its actions, its factors and how it acts and what it's used for, but what are the agents that we use? These are classified according to their mainly, so we are talking about their actions. So mainly according to their interaction with nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. They are a uh, depolarizing drug, which is actually only one, succinylcholine, and there are other drugs which are not in, not in use. And the non-depolarizing neuromuscular drugs acts as a competitive antagonist, competing with acetylcholine for binding sites of the receptors. Succinylcholine, within 30 seconds after IV administration, patients experience escalations from depolarization and antidromic activation or unparalyzed portions of the motor unit, flexi paralysis and shears. Seconds later, within 60 seconds. An IV dose of 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg, which is 3 to 5 into ED95, yields flexi paralysis in one or two minutes. And the recovery is within seven to 12 minutes. Pharma, which is the pharmacokinetic section cone is metabolized by deuterocholine stage, which is also known as pseudocholine stage or plasma cholinic stage. What is phase two block? Phase two block typically develops after large doses of succinylcholine, that is more than four milligram per kg after repeated doses or even after a continuous infusion. Some characteristics of phase two block may even be described in a low dose. This type of block occurs when the post-junctional membrane action potential eventually returns to baseline despite the continued activation of the receptors in the presence of succinylcholine. 
Phase two block is associated with some of the features of non-depolarizing block, including train of four fade and post-tetonic potentiation. And it can be reversed with anticoagulant neostigmine. So what happens is plasma cholinesterase deficiency in patients with atypical or deficient plasma cholinesterase recovery from succinyl choline and mevacolin can be prolonged. Adverse effect of succinyl choline for hyperkalemia, we all know these. Uh, uh, administration of succinyl choline for routine intubation for children has largely been abandoned, as I have already said. FD has issued a box warning for this. It also causes malignant hyperthermia, mild years, increased intragastric pressure, increased intraocular pressure, increased intracranial pressure, and allergic reactions. Cardiac dysrhythmias. And then we have non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. In general, the speed of onset of neuromuscular block, uh, block depends on the potency of the drug. The greater potency is associated with slower onset. Rocurinam with an ED95 of 0.3 has much more rapid onset than Vecurinam, which has ED95 or 0 0.05. Uh, the standard intubating dose of uh, non-depolarizing is two to three times the ED95 for the specific drug. A dose of 10% of the ED95 can be maybe utilized to maintain an ex existing level of neuromuscular block during anesthesia. Rocurinam has a faster onset than other non-depolarizing neuromuscular agents. Thus, rocurinam may be used at higher doses as an alternative to succinyl choline for rapid sequence induction and intubation. Rocurinam does not release histamine or is it vagolighting and it causes milliman hemodynamic effects. The incidence of allergic reactions to rocurinam and succinyl choline appears to be higher than the other three. Dosing and onset, the standard intubating dose is 0.6, which is 2 into 95 for 1.5 to 3 minutes, but if you want to reduce it, we can increase the dose to 4 into ED95, and we can integrate the patient in 60 seconds. Pharmacokinetics, it is excreted mostly through the biliary route, although a small portion is excreted renally. Its metabolism results in whatever. Vecurinium, it is not used in alternative to succinyl choline for RSI because of slower onset time. An intubating dose of vecurinium of 0.1 milligram per kg or 2 into ED95 with an intubating time of 3 to 4 minutes. Pharmacokinetics, it is excreted both through the biliary and the renal route. Thus, patients with renal and hepatic disease may have a prolonged response to vecurinium. Pancurinium, which is a long acting steroidal. Neuromuscular agent that is rarely used because it is high incidence of postoperative residual neuromuscular weakness and it also causes tachycardia. Atracurium, if we go to the benzyl isoprenium group, it is an intermediate acting benzyl isoprenium agent uh, that is a mixture of 10 isomers. But dosing, intubating dose of 0 0.5 milligram per kg or 2 into ED95 provide, provide adequate intubating conditions in three to five minutes. The maintenance dose of atriquidum is 0 0.1 milligram per kg or an infusion of 10 to 20 mi uh, microgram per kg per minute, guided by neuromuscular monitoring. A higher dose than 0 0.5 milligram per kg atriquidum increases plasma histamine levels and for this condition, atracurium is nowadays is becoming very unpopular. Rather, cis atracurium is taking its place. Atracurium uh, is metabolized through non specific plasma stages, as known as Hoffman elimination. And the uh, end product, one of the end products is laudanosine, which is a compound which can produce epileptogenic and animal studies when administered in large doses. Cisatribulum, as I said, it is getting popular. Uh, it is the cis isomer of atricurium and it's four times more potent than atricurium. Intubating dose is 0.15 to 0.2 milligram per kg or 3 into ED95, and its clinical duration is 35 to 50 minutes. Pharmacokinetics, again, is primarily metabolized through Hoffman elimination. And the good thing about cisatribulum is it has no active metabolites. It is a short-acting non-depolarizing benzyl isoconinium neuromuscular agent. 
that was developed as an alternative to succinyl choline. Large doses are required for intubation because of the drug's low potency. An intubating dose of 0.2 mg per kg or 3 into 895 provides adequate intubating conditions in 3 to 4 minutes and duration of action is 15 to 20 minutes. Pharmacokinetics mostly metabolized by plasma cholinesterase. It does not have any active metabolites. Reversal with either neostigmine or adithonium is faster than with this spontaneous metabolism. Thank you.